So welcome everybody. Um, it's good to see you uh, at uh, our first pre-concert talk. I'm very happy to welcome Mark Travis. Mark, uh, thanks for joining us. I mean, we were on a fantastic run of all Beethoven sonatas until we were not. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so um, we will resume that project, Mark. I promise you, we'll resume that project when things will be safe. So. But in the meantime, I'm very happy to see you uh, joining us for the print concert talk. Kenny, very nice to meet you. I'm really looking forward to seeing you at, uh, in a few days you know, and hearing your recital. It's going to be exciting. For sure, it's going to be an unusual experience. Um, we have outside concerts. And um, so we'll see how it goes. It'll be uh, a new experience. Uh, as I mentioned before, grab your fleece blankets, you know, just in case it's chilly, so that you feel warm and cozy. And um, we will make it happen. We will work with our uh, challenges, whatever they may be. Um, just uh, a few little things. We are already sold out at the Candlelight series, so uh, just in case you were planning to come, uh, be sure to... Um, you can still uh, put your name on the wait list if you were interested in going to that series. And uh, we probably will have some tickets available last minute. Uh, some patrons might you know, not um, decide not to come this time. So uh, be sure to be on the wait list and we will let you know uh, if the tickets are available. We still have tickets for the Breezeway uh, series. So we would love to see you join us. And uh, Mark... I will let you start with a, you know, discussion about composers and um, and the works Kenny is planning to play, and then we will do a little interview with Kenny. So, go ahead. Thank you so much. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, and so nice to see so many of you again. Um, it's hard to believe the last time that I was on an airplane was the day I came back from a Grand Piano Series uh, lecture and recording. So. Um, it seems a lifetime ago, hard to believe it was March 3rd, I think. So uh, very happy to see familiar faces and friends and, and loved ones uh, on, on the screen and uh, have this chance to talk about music, um, which is one of my very favorite things to do. So um, in looking at this uh, program that Kenny has assembled, we really have some interesting literature on here. Uh, this is a this is the type of program that I, as a broadcaster, would put together. Uh, and there are a lot of really wonderful connections in it. And um, I, I, I would say one common thread is almost that we have a lot of composers that are just a little on the neglected side. Uh, not Chopin, of course, but uh, Metner, Karl Maria von Weber, um, and even to a degree Scriabin. Scrabin still, um, while pretty well represented in piano circles, maybe doesn't always get the um, get his due. I think so. Um, this is really an exciting program to to talk about. So I want to begin in talking a little bit about Karl Maria von Weber because we're going to hear his Sonata Number no. Four in E Minor, Opus Seventy, and Weber is definitely one of those overlooked geniuses. Uh, he lived from 1768 until 1826, uh, so that means he's about 12 years younger than Mozart. In fact, he is a cousin of Mozart's wife, uh, Costanza von Weber. That's the same uh, Weber family. Um, he lived a very short life. Uh, he had a lot of health and, well, kind of a lot of difficulties during the course of his career. Uh, he died at the age of 39 from tuberculosis, but um, he didn't have such an easy start to his life as well. He um, was born with a congenital hip defect, and so he wasn't actually able to start even walking until the age of four. And then there was a period of time later in his life where he had a court appointment and he actually ended up being arrested and later banned from uh, the municipality along with his father uh, for charges of bribery and embezzlement. It's, it's really some fascinating reading. But in the meantime, he was this really uh, inventive, uh, terrific composer. And, you know, um, like a lot of these tragic romantic 
figures, uh, he did quite a lot in his uh, short life uh, for art. It really, it is uh, Karl Maria von Weber, along with maybe Felix Mendelssohn and uh, Franz Schubert, they really and truly kind of take what Beethoven starts. They take the Beethoven revolution and then they carry us across the threshold truly and you know all in for the romantic movement at, at least you know where it comes to Austro-Hungarian music. So where Weber's concerned, you know, it, it's a name that maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Maybe he was a footnote, you know, if you ever took a music appreciation course. Uh, where people tend to know him, where his legacy, I think, is most firm, uh, is in his vocal writing. He uh, wrote uh, some very, very successful operas and was really considered to be a, a strong innovator in that genre. Uh, he crafted the idea of leitmotifs and really took that to a, to a new level. Um, without Weber, we don't probably get to Wagner. Uh, certainly not in the same century. Um, his opera Der Freischutz, which is kind of a zingspiel, meaning that there's a lot of spoken dialogue as well as the music, uh, similar to Mozart's Magic Flute, uh, is still very much a repertoire piece. We don't see it quite as often as you might like in the United States or Canada, but um, it's still uh, you know, programmed regularly throughout the German-speaking world. And it's also a very good piece for young voices. So you'll see opera workshops and universities uh, stage productions of it as well. Um, the, uh, it also has an uh, overture that you'll see on concert programs from time to time. He has another opera, Oberon, which has absolutely nothing to do with Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, that is also, other than its you know mythical beings, uh, that uh, the overture to Oberon also gets done. And those are probably like the two pieces that get the most attention outside of the world of uh, the piano and piano music. But I, I like the idea, and I like to point out this idea that you know he had strength in songwriting and, and opera writing. Um, he was actually, he actually wrote one of the very first song cycles. And keep in mind, you know, Schubert was almost a direct contemporary of his. Uh, so, you know, it's said that he had a really good singing voice himself, and it remained an important part of his life. And I think just when you listen to his other works, um, you definitely hear the vocalism. You hear that, you know, this is someone who really did know uh, his way around the human voice and, and understood, you know, the, the singing quality that I think a lot of us like to hear in music, you know, it certainly makes that melody, makes that piece uh, stick with you as, as well as a performance. So I have to admit my first exposure um, to Weber, I had read about Der Freischutz, um, you know, being a, a voice major in college, but my other instrument was classical guitar and, um, you know, continued to play at a pretty high level um, for, for some time. And it was actually when I was, um, asked to accompany some singers who wanted to sing these um, arias that uh, Weber wrote that really put him on the map for me, I guess, you know, because it was just such a pleasure to play and such a pleasure to sing. Now, I'm having some tech issues today, which is a heck of a thing for a guy like me to say, uh, in that my laptop is down and I'm down a, a couple of pieces of equipment. I, I initially had this fantasy that I was going to play and sing for you, but uh, that's not going to be possible uh, this time around. However, Milana has uh, a piece queued up that's just a, uh, it's a little cradle song, and it was actually, this is a case where it was originally written for guitar and voice, but it was adapted for piano and voice later on. Not a terribly um, difficult thing to do. And I just kind of want to start out with this as a musical excerpt, just to put us in Weber's world. You'll hear very quickly just how lovely the balance is and just how sweet his, his gift for melody is. I think this is a really great introduction before we delve more deeply into his piano music. So uh, could we hear that uh, clip, Milana, please?
Yeah, that's good. Perfect. So, I mean, it's just lovely. It, you know, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's called a cradle song or a vegan lead, and that's what it sounds like. And just a perfect balance with the accompaniment and, you know, just a very singable melody. And so that's, you know, that's Weber's gift, I think. Um, and, and hopefully that is more evident here. I, I did consider maybe sharing a, an aria from one of the operas, but I, I thought the song literature was a, a better way to, um, you know, be able to hear his pianicism and um, his, his talent for, uh, for voice writing. So in addition to being a pretty good guitarist, you know, he, Franz Schubert and Hector Berlioz, well, touted in other ways. They were all actually very good guitarists. Um, he uh, was also a virtuoso pianist and both Chopin and uh, Liszt really considered him to be uh, an influence in terms of um, piano style, piano technique, uh, things that he did with the instrument. Um, he didn't write a whole lot for the piano necessarily, but this is definitely a case of um, you know, uh, quality over quantity, I would say. Uh, he wrote, um, I think it was the total of about four uh, piano sonatas. Um, he has uh, two concertos, and then uh, perhaps the one of the better known uh, pieces from his repertoire, uh, something that's called a concertstücke or a concert piece in F minor for piano and orchestra. There too, sort of an innovator, uh, very much an in innovator, in fact, in kind of creating this different way for the piano to dialogue, you know, or for a solo instrument to dialogue with an orchestra. So this uh, fourth piano sonata that uh, Kenny is going to play for you is in E minor, it was completed in uh, 1822. Uh, this is towards the end of the composer's life. Uh, he's about 36 years old at the time. And you really kind of hear the full gamut in this piece. You know, I, I don't think he knew that he, he was having a rough time at this period, but I don't think he knew that he expected that he was going to die in a, in a few years. But, you know, you'll hear a lot of melancholy with maybe just a touch of, you know, what I'd call reluctant hope in the first movement of this piece. Um, then we get to the second, which, you know, is almost like an outburst of rage and then, you know, kind of have the andante and C major where, you know, he, it's almost like that friend coming to visit you and, you know, tries to talk you down just a little bit, but maybe gets you in a better place, but doesn't get you quite all the way there. And uh, then, of course, you know, the last movement is just this really, I don't know, wild uh, type, type of movement. Um, you don't hear as much melody, oddly enough, you know, uh, that, that you would expect in a piece by Weber. And um, it just, I don't know, it's almost exhausting, you know, toward, towards the end, uh, but in the best possible way. Um, I almost feel like this is less Weber in a way and more like early Liszt, you know, um, in that same way that I feel that, uh, you know, Bear Gopus One uh, Piano Sonata is maybe the you know, the the last work of Debussy, you know, um, in, in terms of occupying a similar uh, approach and, and, and tonal world. So uh, why don't we hear just a little bit of this? Um, I, I think we picked out a piece of the final movement. Thank you. 
Great. Yeah, so it almost makes me want to hear funiculi funicula, you know, that uh, Tarantella uh, quality uh, through to the end. So, um, and, you know, how terrific is that going to sound? Uh, it's going to be on the Fazioli, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> certo, sì. I mean, at least um, in one concert, for sure. The other good. one, I'm not sure. We'll see about the movers. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so nothing nothing better than hearing. Uh, I have to say, actually, I, re I really love um, the uh, that instrument uh, for this kind of repertoire. You know, of course, it's great to hear Mussorgsky and, uh, you know, some of the gigantic stuff, but uh, Haydn and uh, sounds amazing, as does Bach. So I, I can only imagine. And Skagen. Yeah, all right. What uh, <laughs> what uh, Kenny's going to be able to do, right, on, on this. So, um, so quite logically, um, the program then progresses from someone I would describe as a, you know, lesser known, somewhat lesser known uh, composer from, you know, the Austro-Hungarian uh, school uh, to one of the lesser known composers uh, from the Russian school, and that's uh, Nikolai Mentner. And uh, we're going to hear probably, you know, I, I think some of his most inventive and some of his uh, most characterful work in um, two sets, or at least, um, you know, uh, some uh, selections from these tales. T A L E S that he um, composes. Sometimes, if you if you end up liking these and you look for them, sometimes you'll see them listed as uh, fairy tales. But um, I mean, Milana can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the word uh, uh, Skatsky is really more tale, not necessarily Hans Christian Andersen, but just more like a, a story. So um, I, I see a nod of of approval. <laughs> Russian's the language I always meant to learn. Uh, considering that I, sort of an area of specialty for me, but um, so so Mentner is a, a composer that um, I think as soon as you experience his music, you immediately want to learn more. Uh, that was certainly the case for me, um, and I'm, I'm a little bit later. We'll we'll hear just a little bit of the piece that kind of hooked me in uh, where this composer is concerned. But let's talk a little bit about who he was. So uh, he lived from uh, 1880 to 1951. Uh, so in terms of the timeline, that makes him a somewhat younger contemporary of uh, both Scriabin and Rachmaninoff. And um, he uh, was really a very prolific composer. You know, it's, it's, one of those, it's one thing to find out that you don't know you know, a single piece, you know, I, I think of like the American composer, Deans Taylor, you know, only wrote a handful of things. And so, you know, that's kind of what you would expect. Um, but when you, I remember seeing uh, Metner's catalog and saying, who's this guy? Yeah, he must be some obscure composer. Well, his obscurity had nothing to do with uh, the, the volume of, of work that he had. Um, but perhaps the distinction with him is that, I, to the best of my knowledge, every piece, m with maybe one or two exceptions, uh, involves the piano in some way. Um, and, you know, that includes 14 piano sonatas, um, three violin sonatas, includes some chamber music, uh, includes a piano quartet, it includes a couple of works for uh, two pianos. Uh, and then over a hundred songs, he really was quite skilled and quite gifted in um, writing for the human voice also. So um, it's it's a pretty incredible uh, body of music. And so, you know, to be able to hear these tales, um, I, I think they sort of represent the best of, uh, of Metner and are a real good entryway also into his output. So um, we picked part of the Opus 20. Um, I think this is the second. And Milana, if you want to cue that, uh, we'll let that be a musical introduction, please.
someday we'll have fade outs in Zoom. That'll be a, a wonderful day. Um, so, you know, you get a, a sense of um, what his musical language was like. If, if he was criticized for anything, he, he was definitely well liked amongst those who knew him. Um, and while his music was maybe a little conservative uh, for the time, um, he seemed to have a, a, a lot of respect uh, amongst his peers and was really a, a quite fine pianist. Um, probably could have made that more the primary focus, but uh, he was so devoted to teaching and to composition, he didn't really do that. Um, and uh, that was sort of to the chagrin of his family because he probably would have had a more comfortable life had he been more a, of a concert artist first and foremost. But, um, you know, he, in, until the Second World War, was generally okay. Uh, I mentioned that him being a younger contemporary Rachmaninoff, it's actually Rachmaninoff who arranges for him to have a tour of North America uh, in 1924. He travels to the United States, goes to Canada, um, and does you know a whole series of recitals. For the most part, these recitals consisted of his own music. Um, he didn't ever quite adapt in the way that Prokofiev or Rachmaninoff did in kind of learning what um, the expectations for concerts were in, in North America and didn't really want to tailor his programming accordingly. And so um, after a time, you know, it just, just kind of stopped doing it. Uh, but where he was really held in high esteem uh, was in England. And so around 1936, uh, he and his wife, uh, Anna, um, end up uh, settling down in London. And, you know, he lives a pretty modest living, uh, equal parts as a composer, as a teacher, and uh, as a performer when the opportunity presents itself. Um, it's it's interesting, I suppose, to note that, you know, he he wasn't someone who fled after the revolution in 1917, but he stayed put. But then, you know, um, after the other political upheavals, you know, he ends up settling in England. Then, um, you know, tragedy happens in the form of World War II. Uh, he loses all of his um, publishing royalties uh, in, in Germany, you know, during this time. And so that causes him you know, to really have to lean heavily on uh, the favors of, you know, friends and, and family members, and his health starts to decline around this time, too. Now, he has a very interesting first champion. In um, 1949, the Maharaja of Mysore ended up founding the first Metner Society. It was just a local society, not an international society. But the uh, whole point of it was to embark on a recording project of all of Metner's works, um, hopefully with him. And, and very forward thinking in a way, thinking that, gosh, you know, we have this technology, wouldn't it be great to get the majority of this literature in the, um, in the composer's own hand? And so uh, that project took off. Um, Metner was very beholden to the Maharaja, who was a great, great music lover. Um, he had been an honorary fellow at uh, Trinity College of Music in London, and he was also the first president of the um, London Philharmonic or Philharmonia uh, Society. And so um, Metner embarks on this series of recording sessions and gets through quite a bit. You know, again, this is 1949. He dies in 1951. And um, but he manages to record uh, all three of his piano concertos, the last of which is dedicated to the Maharaja. Uh, he gets some, some of the sonatas, he gets some chamber music in there, and then he actually gets a lot of his songs. And uh, he pairs up with some of the greatest artists of the time uh, with these songs. And so I'd, I'd like to share, this is just a little two minute uh, example of one of those where he's with the great soprano Elisabeth Schwarzkopf. And um, let's cue that up.
Well, it really doesn't get a whole lot better than that, uh, either in terms of vocal quality or in terms of um, the accompaniment. And um, it's just so wonderful that we have these documents, isn't it? You know, that we are able, you know, um, how we wish we could hear Beethoven, how we wish we could hear Mozart, but we can hear Rachmaninoff, we can hear Nikolai Metner, we can hear Bartok. And uh, it just, uh, it, it's something that still makes an impression on me uh, each and every time that, um, you know, these things that we're doing, maybe what we're doing at the Grand Piano Series will one day um, end up also being a, a document that's useful for other people to appreciate the, the artistry of our era. Um, so I'm assuming that once everybody hears this music, they're going to want to maybe hear a little bit more. And so I want to share just a, maybe a minute or two of kind of the first of the piece that was my first exposure uh, to Metner. Uh, it was at the International Keyboard Institute and Festival in uh, New York City. In fact, it was um, there probably about 18 years ago that I first met, met uh, Raniero. And uh, the, there was a, a pianist by the name of Irina Morozova who performed this piece um, on forgotten melodies. And uh, it still haunts me to this very day. So uh, let's, let's hear maybe just the opening minute or so. Though I could go on and on, and uh, I definitely uh, suggest uh, looking into it. Um, people are definitely still uh, discovering Metner's music uh, as recently as 2017. Uh, an international Metner uh, society was formed in Berlin, and um, there have definitely been some champions of his music. Uh, our friend Mark Andre Hamlin, you know, was the first I think to record all 14 of the piano sonatas. Um, there have been a couple of Russian singers who have really um, advocated for his vocal music as well. And um, I have to say, you know, when I, when I did my first deep dive, you know, say in 2002 or so, um, there were maybe a fourth of the recordings and performances available for, for listening now. So there too, um, it's what, what an age we live in. <laughs> so, um, then we get to some more uh, familiar territory, perhaps, with uh, Chopin and the uh, Polonaise um, Fantasy Opus 61 in A-flat major. Uh, this work is written and published in 1846. And uh, this is, stands out to, to me in the Chopin canon because, you know, I mean, Chopin is safe, right? You know, we look at a we see an artist is coming to town. We, we take a look at the program and it's like, oh, they play Chopin. It tells us a couple of things, right? It tells us they're probably a, a fine pianist, but also tells us that, um, you know, it's maybe easy, easy on the ears, you know, not, not too terribly challenging. But this is a piece that took arguably over a century to really get its fair due because it's not necessarily the typical Chopin. I mean, it's typical in the fact that Yes, he bases it on a polonaise, 
uh, sort of, um, you know, certainly uh, uh, does in terms of the the rhythm and um, overall structure, maybe the the melodic materials to a degree. But um, people were pretty critical of of this piece, and you know, what's wrong with it? You know, well, of course, nothing is wrong with it. It was just different for its time and different um, with you know, what we're expecting from, from Chopin, perhaps. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think I read somewhere that originally he was only going to call this piece a fantasy. He was actually going to leave the Polonaise out of it. But, you know, again, the meter and rhythm definitely um, nod to that dance form. Um, but, you know, the piece is intricate and it's complex, uh, really quite complex in, in terms of um, its harmonic qualities, at least for that time. And, you know, thankfully now it's a part of the standard repertoire, but, you know, it was only a couple of generations ago that maybe it wasn't, you know, uh, Horowitz, of course, famously championed this work uh, later. One of my favorite pianists, Claudio Rao, also uh, made it something of a signature work. Uh, we heard a heck of a performance as part of the Grand Piano Series, as, as I recall. Um, so, um, I, I think, you know, it'd be interesting just to get a little taste of it. You know, Chopin is definitely one of those composers that's almost just better. Yeah, let's just hear it, uh, rather than, uh, talk about it to death. Um, here we get a true preview in a way in that it's, um, uh, a little cut that's on a Fazioli piano, uh, performed by, well, he's still young, but an even younger uh, Daniil Trifonov. We at least had one tonal pillar there, right? But, uh, you know, you can hear the complexity. I mean, it, it becomes pretty evident, you know, like when MGM made all those great Tom and Jerry cartoons where you know, the mouse would dance around to uh, Chopin and Liszt. They didn't pick this piece. Yeah, they yeah, went to, to other sources. Now, uh, it's been said of this work, and I think it's a, an interesting um, summary that, you know, this work stands apart in a way where it presents a change in the style of Chopin, um, kind of creating, going from late period to last period. And really, you know, it, I, I think that's a, a interesting way to think about it. You know, this last period of Chopin, what would he have continued to do had he lived a little bit longer? Um, I think the only other work that we can really compare this piece to 
you know, is indeed um, the F minor mazurka, the Opus 68, number four, uh, which was uh, Chopin's last piece. So um, all things to kind of think about and consider as um, you're hearing uh, uh, Chopin on an even better Fazioli uh, with the with the grand piano series. So, um, Milana, do you want uh, I can I can talk about Scrabin a little bit, or um, do we want to do want to keep in that vein, or do you want to? Um, well, yeah, I start for a little about Scrabin. We probably will be here until five thirty. <laughs> so, <laughs> I I yeah. say um, we have a short interview with Kenny. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of to introduce him to our audience, and then Kenny, if you want to say a few th you know words about Scrabin, uh, uh, oh. you know, kind of lead our audience into what to expect um, on Monday and Tuesday, that would be fantastic. So, um, right, and I, I will just say that this is also just a, a very thoughtful. Um, program, you know, uh, a, a through course because. Um, while well, Scrabin got very different very quickly, uh, to say the least, um, Chopin was a major, major influence on him in the earliest period of, of his life. And so, you know, that's really wonderful to kind of recall that and, and see that connection in this programming. So, uh, Kenny, I got to say, uh, programming is, is, is really outstanding, really, really wonderful. treat. We wish you were with us, Mark, on this. Uh... I do, too. <laughs> I'd go both ways. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly. <laughs> um, Kay, I have a question. I've, I've noticed that you have um, a piece that you'll be performing, which you wrote. Yeah. And um, I wanted to know how much time do you spend on composing and, and you know, how, how big a part of it, you know, it, it takes in your life? Well, it's a new part of my life. Uh, actually, I started composing uh, around March or April when everything shut down and all my concerts were canceled and I didn't have a lot to do. So I'd always uh, I'd always wanted to compose and I always uh, wanted to, you know, try to make that a part of my life. Just uh, not not to be a composer as much as just to, uh, you know, increase my knowledge of, you know, to make me a better musician. And, and I think it has. Um, and so I've, I've, uh, I, I've composed a few pieces now and they're, um, they're very much, you know, indebted to other composers. Um, uh, you know, it sort of comes out of my love for Medner, who's absolutely one of my favorite composers, uh, and also, uh, Faré and Chopin. And, uh, so, it's it's a new thing for me. I'm enjoy I'm enjoying doing it. So I hope if other people enjoy it too, then that's a that's an added plus. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, and uh, sorry, uh, I hear myself. Um, Kenny, the love for Metner's music was it inspired uh, by people that surround you, or is it something that you discovered on your own? No, not not really. Um, you know. I, I didn't used to, uh, I've known a lot of Medner's music for, for quite some time. Uh, you know, since, since I was a kid, I've heard some Medner, but I didn't really start getting into it until a couple of years ago. And I learned the big uh, Nightwind Sonata, which is one of his major, uh, it was his longest sonata. Um, and over the past year or two, I've, I've really started to listen to, you know, pretty much all of it and uh, study it a lot more. And uh, he, he really is, I think, one of the major composers for the piano. As, as Mark mentioned, uh, he did, he, everything that he wrote included the piano in it. Uh, even his chamber music, he wrote a quintet and a few violin sonatas and a few other violin pieces. His wife was a violinist. Um, but the, he was a piano-centric composer like Chopin uh, and, and actually, uh, he, he played a bit of Chopin, uh, was one of the few other composers that he played other than himself. So um, uh, he's, he's a very interesting character in music history. Uh, he was uh, uh, a little bit older than, I think a little bit older than Rachmaninoff, 
uh, but uh, they were very close throughout their life. I've gone through a lot of their uh, correspondence, and they pretty much had weekly correspondence for decades. And I'm, I'm not sure that Rachmaninoff had too many other people like that in his life. So uh, they really were significant in each other's lives, and uh, they, their compositional styles, while they, they are, I think, a little bit more different than people realize, uh, that that's the first thing that hits you immediately is, wow, this sounds a lot like Rachmaninoff. Wonderful. Um, so I have been your fan since the Clyburn. I, I watched your performances uh, uh, on, the, on the internet and as well as Tchaikovsky competition. So I'm really excited to hear you live now. It's going to be uh, wonderful. But you, you know, it's what's interesting is that you've done two really mega competitions, right? And um, Tell me about, you know, what it is, you know, because most of the people would do, let's say, Clyburn, and you were one of the top, you know, prize winners. Uh, and then you went to Tchaikovsky. What it is that um, kind of prompted you to go to do another major competition and challenge yourself? I mean, I'm sure it's a very big emotional stress also. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really a actually when I decided to do the Tchaikovsky competition it really wasn't something I wanted to do. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't enjoy competing really. I enjoy, I enjoy certain aspects of it. I enjoy, you know, uh, the pressure of getting all that music ready and the whole experience is, is unique, but, um, I prefer just to be playing concerts, you know, it's, uh, but it's such a good, uh, exposure you know, tool. And, um, and so, and so that's basically why I did it. It was, uh, it was interesting to do another one after the Clyburn because the such different experiences between doing Clyburn and Tchaikovsky. What's um, the biggest difference uh, besides the repertoire? There were, there are a lot of differences in the way those competitions are run. Um, but uh, you really have to talk about it if you don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. Okay, sounds good. No problem. <laughs> um, all right, Mark, do you have any any, any questions uh, uh, for Kenny? Um, yeah, I guess I, I, you know, I'm just curious. I, I love getting into the, the thought process behind the program. Of course, you know, I can look at it at, at one way. Um, but, you know, what was on your mind in terms of, you know, I, I talked about some threads that I see, but, you know, that doesn't mean that's what was well, going through your head. As you're no, putting your, your, your thought process is, is, is pretty similar to mine. I think it, it's, uh, th this is a little bit different because it's a little bit shorter from the programs that I usually build. So it's not really, uh, it, it's, it's not really like a complete program. Sometimes I think originally when I built this program, that was basically just a first half and then there's Schumann fantasy in the second half. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I like the connections uh, between all these composers really uh, specifically between, um, between Scriabin and Chopin and these, these two pieces in particular that the, and you're absolutely right that that the Polonaise fantasy is in in many ways Chopin's most frustrating piece uh, because and I think it's it's the the fantasy uh, aspect of it that that creates this that it's uh, that structurally it's very hard to to pull together and the, and really the key to it is the compositional process that that he doesn't want to resolve anything. Uh, and this is a tool that that he uses a lot and many other, you know, and many other romantic era composers, uh, this, this was absolutely a trend. Uh, and it, really the defining trend that led to the break of tonality. Um, so with with this piece and it, I, I think the end is a very unique thing and and the way he handles the end is similar to the uh, a few other pieces that he wrote, like the fantasy in F minor, mm -hmm. but it, it it barely resolves. the The whole piece uh, 
just keeps going and spiraling. But uh, even when it resolves, it does it in sort of an imperfect manner, which is, uh, which is very hard to pull off, but that's kind of the idea of it. You know, and then you get to the Scriabin sonatas and uh, the Scriabin fifth sonata doesn't resolve at all. Right. Um, so, you know, Scriabin began his compositional career mimicking Chopin, like, like many composers do. They, they start out mimicking another composer, even uh, Ravel started out mimicking Rimsky-Korsakov, you know, someone you think of as, uh, uh, as one of the most unique original composers. Mm -hmm. um, so Chopin was, uh, so Scriabin was taking Chopin's ideas and stretching them even further. Um, and uh, I, I like that connection very much. Well, and I mean, the fifth sonata, I, I mean, uh, Sviatoslav Richter said that the fifth sonata of Scrabin uh, is Artist piece. Really one of the most difficult works in, in the repertoire. Mm -hmm. uh, to him, it was, along with the first Mephisto waltz. And um, yet... That's because he'd never played the Mendner Night Wind Sonata. <laughs> ah, there you go. Right. Well, I was going to say, even with that fact, uh, it's it's the most frequently performed of, of Scriabin's um, mm -hmm. as last I checked. And, and, and you know, I it, it is incredibly difficult, but I, I got to tell you, I played the fourth sonata before I played that, and I find the fourth sonata more difficult just because uh, b because it's shorter and more compact. Uh, right. This This one breathes a little bit more. It's a little bit more stretched out. How does it does it change anything for you as an artist? You know, because this is the first of his piano sonatas, Scriabin's, that is um, that's in a single movement. And then, of course, he must have liked how it worked out because yeah. that 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 becomes the thing. Yeah, this uh, is the fifth sonata is the turning point. Yeah, for Scriabin in his company, and he goes in a very different, actually not really that much of a different direction, but it it accelerates. Mm -hmm. Does that change your? your pacing or the way you think about the piece when it's all kind of contained to a, a single movement? I mean, in a way, it's well, to, to, to a certain extent, you know, the fourth and fifth sonatas are, are very connected. And, uh, you know, even though he separates the fourth sonata into two movements, it, uh, it, it really is kind of, you know, in, in one movement in, uh, in that it doesn't stop at all uh so he, he so he's already started this it's just it just goes a step further uh in in the next knot and and it goes a and it goes a step further harmonically too in that uh it uh you know i guess it it, it is an f sharp minor but uh e flat major is also a very dominant key in that that's sort of the last tonal center of the piece uh and i i still haven't really figured out how he manages to do that and make it successful because that that doesn't usually work. <laughs> right. um, have you tried to delve at all into the world of uh, synesthesia? And of course, you know this is one of the things Scrabin is um, yeah maybe best known for. For people, they might not know his music, but they know this footnote mm -hmm. of uh, you know his ability to see uh, colors. Or, yeah, so so this piece uh, that the the fifth sonata uh, he described the main color of this piece is white blinding light, is mm -hmm. ecstasy. So um, I guess that's something to <laughs> right. think about. <laughs> when he wrote it parallel to the you know to one of his most major symphonic works, the poem yeah. uh, of uh, if if. If you guys want to do some reading beforehand, look into the very graphic poem that he wrote to accompany it. It's it's definitely worth reading. Yeah. I guess I'll have After the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, we did buy uh, you know uh, lights uh, with different colors, so oh, we yeah? probably can arrange for the bright <laughs> light. <laughs> Fantastic. Kenny, I have a question. Um, I've noticed in your bio that you also were quite uh, involved in sports uh, as a, uh, you know, in your school. Uh, are you still playing hockey? And uh... no, I haven't played. I, I, I skated. I, I can. I. It, it came back quickly. It's like riding a bike. But um, 
but yeah, no, I, I played, I had a fairly, you know, uh, normal childhood played, played a lot of sports. I, I still, I'm still a big sports fan. I enjoy watching all of it. Do you have time to play or not so much? No, not really. <laughs> so I, I would assume you you're practicing probably many hours a day. <laughs> Are you in school right now? It looks like a, a, I'm. I'm in my teacher's studio right now. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I am a big fan of his playing as well. So, <laughs> be sure to tell him that. He, he he busted in here earlier. He was wondering what was going on. I told him to get out. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, he's he comes from the Soviet Republic, Uzbekistan. I'm coming from Moldova, also oh. born in the Soviet Union. So. Yeah, definitely uh, familiar with his uh, playing. Well, um, if any of our audience has questions uh, at this time, I would just open up, you know, for a few minutes before we uh, go. So if any of you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand and um, unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Anyone? Therese, you have a question? Michael Mendelssohn. You have to unmute yourself, Michael, though. So I'm going to ask you, you have to come to the computer and unmute yourself. <laughs> because you're muted. Are we there? Perfect, yes. Hi. So Michael uh, tunes welcome. in from Leeds, England. Welcome. Yes, you may have heard of the Leeds International Piano Competition. Of course. <laughs> of I applied to it once. Sorry? I applied to it once, actually. Michael, well, you have to pull some some connections, you know, just pull some threads, you know, maybe he'll apply again. <laughs> uh, we're all struggling to make the, uh, see what's happening in the next year, but there's no music, no concerts going on at all here. So, what's the... You have... I know it's, it's difficult to say from a, a musician's point of view, who do you um, put as uh, on top of the platform for your favorite music, favorite pianist? So I'm, I'm having trouble hearing. Is so the favorite pianist? Who who do you relate your love for, your um, admiration for? Well, a lot, <laughs> a lot of people, mostly dead ones. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, but there's one or two living that are supposed to be top of the uh, Yeah, I mean, I love, uh, you know, I love certain things about the way Horowitz played. I think he really figured out uh, how to play in a big space, you yes. know, with, with uh, in large spaces, it becomes more important to have bigger contrasts. Uh, you were lucky enough to see him. Sorry about what about the ones that are living? Ones that are living. Hmm. Well, I, I don't, you know, I, I I don't know because there are so many I haven't heard and you just can't judge from recordings. You know, after going through the process of doing recordings, it's not the real thing. Uh, it, it doesn't give you a true... Um, Presence. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't give you a true sense of what that person can actually do on the concert stage. Um, so, um, I don't really know. Is the you know there are many wonderful pianists out there. I wouldn't want to single one of them out. You're putting him in trouble, Michael. He can't possibly answer that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I okay. suppose it's true. It's, it's, it's um, as our age, we we're lucky enough that we've heard so many in your life. But uh, we're going to miss you because. I'm in England, and they won't let me come over for your concert. Well, Michael, we'll record this concert, and you will be able to hear it online. So. Yes, absolutely. That's <laughs> the right. Uh, great, great choice of music. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. Okay, anybody else has um, a question or a comment? Well, if nobody has any questions or comments, I want... Uh, to thank all of you, whoever is planning to come to the event on Monday or Tuesday, I'm looking forward to seeing you. If you cannot join us in person, you'll be able to see a video at a later time. Uh, it will be available for purchase uh, on our website, and I will, of course, email you. 
I want to thank Mark. Thank you so much for tuning in and for once again brilliantly doing a pre-concert talk. Kenny, you're awesome. I can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, shoot me an email if you have any any special needs. We will try. I to got it. I'll it. respond. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, and be sure to take your cashmere sweater. <laughs> will do. If I have one. <laughs> Well, fleece will do. Look, what you're wearing, I think you're wearing a Clyburn shirt, right? Yeah, most, most of my clothes I got for free. So Perfect. <laughs> just a your... hockey sweater. <laughs> Clyburn, Clyburn fleece shirt is just fine. So <laughs> we, we won't, uh, um, I mean, it's going to be a comfortable performance. It's going to be unusual for sure for all of us, you know. We haven't done any outside performances on Fazioli F308 yet in the winter conditions, but uh, there's always a first time, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you for tuning in. Uh, this, is going, this video is going to be also available online for our listeners who couldn't join us today. And I will see you all soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>